So we're at the, at the, the next wave Europe in, in Amsterdam. Uh, Nicolai, you are the co-founder of Blablacar. You just gave your your uh, keynote about uh, your trust research and about Blablacar. Uh, last year, I had an interview with your colleague Frederick uh, in your headquarters in Paris. So then we also use Blablacar to uh, to get to your your office. Blablacar is a international ride sharing uh, platform. Uh, you, you are growing really fast. Uh, so uh, how are things going? Well, you know, it, it's going really well, right? So so we we keep on growing. Uh, the, the main goal over the last few years has been to turn Blablacar into really a European and a global company. So we've been focusing on expanding in Europe and also outside of Europe in countries like Russia, Ukraine, India, Mexico, Brazil, Turkey. Uh, so now we have this like pretty massive global footprint uh, and we try to develop the activity within that, that footprint. And how do you manage such a fast growth? Because you started just uh, with a really small team, now you're growing really fast, also different offices in, in different countries. So how do, how do you manage to, to keep the growth also sustainable and how, so, how do you also get the, the company culture uh, sustainable? So, so we, I mean, uh, to, to, to scale fast, right, we used, uh, we used different technique, right? So, so one of them was to scale also by acquisition, right? So, so we realized that sometimes the best way to get into a country like Russia or Germany, or we've done that for Italy or Mexico as well, is to find like a, a local uh, blah blah car, essentially or something that more or less like blah blah car locally, to find a great team, acquire the company, get the team on board, and you know, that's one of the way we accelerated growth because then you, you don't have to worry about like finding the right person, training the right person. You end up with like very, very passionate um, entrepreneurs that wanted to do that, but have the same vision and the same passion and the same culture most of the time, right? So that's one of the way we accelerated international growth. Uh, then you know, it's all about hiring and hiring the right people. Uh, so clearly it's a challenge. Uh, it's been a challenge, I think, for most companies. How do you hire like top talents, both in local teams and in the central team? So it's been one of the key focus in the company. And we really focused on people that share the vision and share the culture. And to me, one of the biggest learning actually of the last two years is you know, real bit skills. So essentially, like if you get people that, uh, you know, of course are really smart, but really want to work for Black Black Car, really want, they're really passionate about the activity, passionate about sharing economy, um, you, you can integrate them a lot faster and you keep the DNA and the culture of the company intact. Uh, so so we, we've been managing this sort of hyper growth by a mix of acquisition and hiring, but every time you have that like very strong culture DNA in mind. And how do you make the, the decisions? I think uh, they're also really part of your uh, of your own DNA. But how do you say, okay, these uh, uh, company or these individual are matching with our cultures and with our uh, what you also want to be, and uh, these are not. So uh, the, the first thing is you know we spend time. So I was talking about trust and how you build trust, uh, interpersonal trust. Uh, and I was saying during my presentation, you know, it takes time. So it takes like a repetition of interaction before you trust someone. It's the same, it's very, very true when you do M&A, right? So if you do a, an acquisition of a company, you need to spend like month uh, with the founders of the company understanding what's their, what's their motivation, what's their passion, what's their culture as a company. So we spend a lot of time um, with these companies before we acquire them so that we know their culture, but they also know our culture and, you know, and they feel that they're going to fit. Um, so that's pretty critical. Um, and then I would say, most of, uh, of what's been driving like yes, no for us in, in, in an acquisition, like doing it versus not doing it, um, was really down to culture and DNA again. You know, because if you feel that you want to work with that person, you want to build Russia with Alexei, for example, you want to build Germany with Olivier, um, essentially you know that somehow it's going to work. You, if you have a doubt if, from either side, you should really probably not do it, right? So, so it takes time building a relationship, making sure the culture is, is shared, the passion is shared. Uh, and most of the time when you have that, things go fairly well. And also you as, as, an, as, an, as an individual, as a person, entrepreneur and leader, also made quite some developments, uh, I guess, uh, the last uh, last years. So so uh, what were your, uh, as, as being an entrepreneur and, and, and as being a leader, what were your own most valuable lessons learned? So, so one thing I always believed is that, you know, as we grow, you would be able to delegate more and hire more people and essentially work less and less. Uh, and I thought like, you know, the, 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 the moment where you work the most in a startup is the, uh, the early day of the startup. And clearly during the early day of the startup, you work a lot. And I thought then it would go down. It doesn't, right? So even though you hire ton, uh, lots, of, lots of people, there is so much growth, so many new things we need to do all the time, so many new challenges, so many new opportunities that you know, I ended up actually working more and more over time, right? So if I think of like 
uh, the three founders of the company. I think we work more now, or almost as much now, as we did in the early days of, of the company. Yet, you know, the, the challenge is like, how do you make sure you hire the right people, the right leaders in the organization, so that you scale you know, globally, but you scale your culture? Because you, know, you get to a point where, compared to like three years ago, where you know, either Fred, Francis, or I uh, could have like direct contact with almost all the employees. Today, we have 500 employees. So it's, it's impossible for the three of us to have direct contact with like, you know, almost 500 people. It just doesn't, doesn't work anymore. So you need to make sure you have like a, a layer of management uh, that share that culture, share that vision, share the methods, uh, you know, share all of all, all this playbook we created uh, so that it trickles down uh, through the organization. And, and to do that, you know, we, we do all kind of training off-site. We have like uh, every week we do what we call the blah blah talk. So the blah blah talk is like an online meeting where you know, every time, um, you know, every week like a team is going to present what they do. Um, so we've been sort of like processizing when you're creating processes uh, to, to share knowledge in the company. And I found that very, um, very, very, very powerful and, and really required because you don't need that when you're 20 people. You probably don't need that when you're 50. When you're 500, if you haven't created like the, uh, the, the right leadership in your organization, if you have not created the right processes in the organization, the information flow becomes very, very complex, right? Yeah, but I think it's also uh, it, uh, it's also about leadership management, but it's also about letting go, because uh, that's also what I like about your core values. They're all really focused on trust people and do things. And I think also the only way to really grow really fast is by letting go, because if you want to check everything of what happened, then you can never grow as fast as you are doing. No, that's true. So, so, so we have lots of uh, lots of values around like experimenting, right? In a way, so you fail, learn, succeed. Uh, yeah. Uh, share more, learn more, uh, done is better than perfect. So those are like the values of the company. And in a way, as, as you say, they, they gear towards scaling fast, right? So it's like screwing up is okay as long as you learn from it and you fix it uh, or, or you, you, you do better next time. So, so those, are, those are key cultures, uh, you know, key values for us. Uh, then you always need to find the balance between letting go and still being in touch. Right, and again, it's back to creating the right processes and hiring the right people, so that you feel that the information still flows back to you, but the relevant information, right? So like you know, the, the very condensed information. Um, so to me, it was the big learning of the last two or three years is like how to scale fast, how to, as you say, sort of let go of many things because otherwise you're never going to scale because you're just one person and you have 24 hours. So one thing that doesn't scale is your time as founder, it's still 24 hours a day. Um, so, so uh, you know, as you create the right processes and the right leadership in the company, and you, you let go, but partially and step by step, yeah, you can start scaling and still, to some extent, controlling the destiny of the business. And talking about you uh, uh, as a leader, because um, you have a vision, uh, but how do you uh, uh, make sure that that, that, that is long-term vision, how do you translate it to day-to-day -to -day practice? Yeah, it's very interesting what you, what you just said, because I, I find that people uh, often confuse vision, strategy, and tactics, right? And, and, and sometimes people are very confused between the three and they don't realize what it is. Uh, and very often they confuse strategy with vision, right? So a, a vision is something that typically doesn't really change, right? So it's like a long-term mission. It's like something you, it's near North Star. It's where you want to go. So, so for us, you know, we want to become like the biggest terrestrial uh, ground transport company in the world. Uh, we want to become like the trust index for the world. So that's a vision. Now, are we going to get there one day? I hope so, but it's always going to be for a long time a vision. Strategy is different. Strategy is more like the one, two year or three year horizon where you, know, you decide, okay, we want to be European. What are we going to do? We're going to start maybe acquiring companies. We're going to change the, uh, the organization of the company so that we have coordination teams centrally and we're going to put like, you know, some, um, some resources and some responsibilities in local teams. Uh, we're going to fundraise. You know, all of that is part of your strategy. And then you have tactics, which is really like you get down to, I would say, like a, a weekly or monthly or maybe quarterly um, um, uh, timeline. Okay, what do you do? How do you change course within that strategy? Uh, so uh, you know, I think it's important to understand like, those three layers of the vision that's the North Star. Strategy is like, okay, how, how do you find a path to, some, uh, to, to somehow get closer to that vision? And tactics, it's all the stuff, all the operational stuff you do every day. So, so I tend to think of these three things as, you know, one is like infinite timeline, one is like a one, three year timeline, strategy, uh, and the other one is more like a weekly, monthly or quarterly timeline, tactics and operations. And then for yourself, how do, how do you make uh, how do you manage to 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 have the the long term view, but also how do you how do you then translate it for yourself in your own daily job to your daily practice? 
So, so I think you know, vision is not something you revisit very often, right? I mean, otherwise you don't know where you're going, right? So, so vision is your north star. So it's something we do, you know, like every year we, we think about our values, we think about the vision and the mission of the company uh, and we adjust that, but you know, it's, like, it's just like adjusting it in a way. Uh, strategy is interesting because the, the, the way you define, okay, what path you're gonna use, you know, how fast you wanna grow, um, do you want to become profitable one day in, in a year or in five years or how do you plan that? Um, do you want to be even more global or you know, diversify? Uh, to, to do that, you need to get out of the, the, uh, you know, the operation of the business for a while. So what I try to do, uh, I try to always save a day. So I have like on my calendar some like no meeting days or no meeting afternoon. And that's the only time where I have time to digest a bit what's going on and think about like what we're doing. Like you know, strategically, are we doing the right thing? So, so you need to, I think, isolate yourself a bit from the day-to-day -day operation. Otherwise, you might like you might completely lose on strategy. And if, again, I've seen lots of, um, of companies that have a vision. They have like you know, um, operations and tactics, but actually they forgot to have a strategy, right? So yeah, yeah. What I always do is uh, I, I have two offices, one office to, to work and one office to think. And the office to think uh, is a cell in an old jail in the place where I live. So it's also on a completely different location. Uh, that also really helps me to focus uh, and to think about, uh, yeah, uh, uh, to start thinking. And you're also now uh, 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 are going to give more energy to the Dutch market because there's also now a team in Amsterdam. Um, so what are your plans for, for the Netherlands? So, so we've been, in a way, we've been operating in the Netherlands for like two years almost, I mean, two or three years, uh, but we never had a local team, which was kind of an exception because the culture has always been to have like very strong autonomous local team. You know, sometimes we acquired them uh, you know, through our m and uh, We haven't done that in the Netherlands thinking that we could operate that from Paris. And quickly we realized that you know, if we want to get to any meaningful scale uh, in the Netherlands, you need a local team. You need like you need to be close to your members. You need to be close to your partners. You need to understand the marketing channels. You need to understand the press locally. Uh, unless you have people on the ground, it's very difficult. So we recognize that like you know, um, uh, late last year, early this year, and decided to open an office uh, in Amsterdam. We just opened this week, so in um, in May. Uh, uh, and now we're going to have like a small local team, like, as we do in most countries, uh, here based in, uh, in Amsterdam. And would the focus be on the, the, the long distance ride sharing or are, you, or, or are you also going to look, okay, can we also make steps in the, in the more short distance uh, ride sharing? So, so what's, what's happening in the Netherlands, so the product is going to be the same product, right? So it's really focused on long distance by, by construction, by essence. Uh, Having said that, what we see in the Netherlands is people tend to, to do like slightly shorter distances because the country is pretty dense. Um, so you know, what could be like 200 kilometers in France or in Germany might be only like 50 or 75 kilometers in the Netherlands. Um, so over time, I think we need to probably rethink a bit the product and to evolve essentially to make sure like the interaction between a driver and a passenger when they want to ride like 50 kilometers or 75 kilometers or even less maybe um, uh, is still relevant in the BlaBlaCar product, right, which has been fought for long distance. So, so we might do some tweaks over time, not just for the Netherlands, just over time, just to, to capture these short distances. And when I say short distances, I really mean like, you know, like tens of kilometers, right, essentially. So between 30, 40 kilometer up to maybe 75, 80 kilometer, where today it's not the core business. The core business starts from 50 and up. Um, so we might adjust the product over time. Yeah, and I think that for that, uh, also to, to manage that, then you also really have to lower thresholds for people to, 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 to join. So maybe also some, some links to, uh, to, to, uh, to Google uh, uh, schedules. Uh, so, so I think this is really interesting to look about, okay, how can we lower the thresholds for people to join and also to get ride sharing in the daily practice? So, uh, so at what way do you think that we can lower these thresholds? Well, so, so I think you have different markets here, right? So, so you have one market that's really commuting. So it's like your people going, from work to home every day. Uh, and typically they don't do 50 kilometers. I mean, some do, but most people do the shorter distances. I, I, I think this one is, is something that no one has really tapped into at scale at least. Uh, and you know, I don't think the Black Black Art product as it stands is actually relevant for that market. I don't think any product I know of, uh, again, at scale in Europe uh, is highly relevant for that market. Um, so, and, but then you have something else. You, you have sort of like these mid-distance journeys, you know, between like 40, 50, 60 kilometers, uh, where it's it's really the typical Babacar usage. Uh, all we need to improve is probably the interaction, the, the speed of interaction between drivers and passengers, so that when you book a ride, you get confirmed very quickly. 
And in a way, you know, it's happening naturally as people move from, you know, over time, they move from the desktop usage to a mobile usage. So today, you know, we have over 50% of BlaBlaCar is purely on mobile. Um, and on mobile, you get the speed of interaction that you didn't get on desktop. So I think like naturally, just by the product going from desktop to mobile and usage going from desktop to mobile, you see people being even very last minute, you know, even more last minute on mobile. You see people actually addressing like shorter distances because they're very uh, responsive on their mobile. Um, so I think a mix of all of that means that we're going to crack that, uh, that mid-distance market. Commuting is a different story. I, today, we're not addressing that. Yeah, no. I think uh, I will be open uh, if you make an integration with, uh, with my Google uh, schedule. They say, okay, Martijn, I see you're, uh, you're driving today from Utah to Amsterdam. So we get also people who, who want to join. So, so that's it. So you, so you don't really have to think about it, but, uh, but the system will, will uh, suggest uh, uh, your, your, your options. Um, and, uh, and I think it's also really interesting because then at the moment that you have, have, have more and more use because now I think the match is really made on practical things. Uh, because like, I, like when I want to go to, to Paris more from, 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 from Amsterdam, there may be 10, 20 or, or there are a limited amount of people uh, which I can join. And I think uh, it will be also interesting at the moment uh, when there is enough skill that you can also make more interesting matches, not only on practical, but also on, okay, who are you? Uh, uh, what are your demands? And then people don't, uh, uh, because then you can really uh, uh, create really meaningful, uh, meaningful meetings uh, in the cars. So I, I think what you describe is sort of the holy grail of, um, of trust and, uh, and matching, right? Uh, which is uh, slowly, I think, you'll be getting there. But to get to the point of like affinity matching you described, which is in a way like very uh, a very strong affinity matching, uh, you, you need like massive scale. So you get to a point where you choose based on price, pickup, time, uh, you know, like all these dimensions, like practical dimensions. But then you would choose also because you've seen that on LinkedIn that person is working in a tech company, and you also work in a tech company, for example, and you want to interact with that person. So at some point, you know, it, I think it's going to happen. I think to some extent. In, in countries like France, Germany, Spain, where we have like very strong usage, it's kind of happening already. So, so people have so many choices that they pick based on different type of affinities. Um, but at the end, it's not really for us to orchestrate that, right? So or, or it is to manage that. So all we do is we try to extract as much information as we can about who you are, how trusted you are by the rest of the community, what we could verify about you, and then we let the community choose. So if you are a journalist and you want to meet like a, a tech person in a car and you realize that, hey, you know, that driver happens to be working in a tech company that I know, um, then, then it's your own choice. So we, we never force matching on, the, on that dimension because at the end it's a human, it's a human decision. So, so, let's, so let's go for the holy grail. You also mentioned the trust. So you also your keynote today here at Next Web Europe. You also talked about your research about trust. You say, okay, trust is also really one of the most important uh, layers of the success of a BlaBlaCar. Uh, you, you did the research about it. Uh, so what did you, uh, what did you do? Yeah, so it's something we, we've been wanting to do for a long time, actually. And we never really had time or resources to do this, uh, this very complete research around trust because we always knew trust is fundamental to what we do, right? If we cannot create trust in a BlaBlaCar community, it's going to be very hard to scale because people are always going to have the feeling that they, you know, they're traveling with a stranger. And our job is to make sure they're not traveling with a stranger. They're traveling with a BlaBlaCar member from which they can get like, lots of information. So, so we've done that study to understand like, how far we are uh, in creating trust in these communities. Um, uh, and today, so, so we've, we've compared essentially a Black Black R profile, like a full Black Black R profile, with all the information we can gather to, in terms of level of trust to the family member, a colleague, a friend. And we realize that you know, over time, as we collect all this information on the Black Black R user, we can get to a level of trust that's higher than a colleague, that's almost as good as a friend, right? So it's very powerful because you're talking about someone that you never met, but because you know, the rest of the community met that person, the rest of the community gathered so much information about that person, and we verified several things about that person, you end up having a trust level that's very, very high. Uh, and we've done all kind of other um, uh, research and study on how likely someone who has engaged with Black Black Car and your know, sharing activity, how likely they are to use like a different vertical, you know, like car rental or, I mean, um, peer-to-peer car rental uh, or, uh, or selling uh, stuff uh, online uh, through peer-to-peer -peer platforms, and we realize that the, the affinity is a lot stronger. So in a way, you know, if you think of the 30 million BlaBlaCar members today, they're a lot more prone to use other services than people that have never used BlaBlaCar. And because of the scale we've reached, again, like 30 million people, 
uh, it means you know we're probably going to unleash even more sharing economy in Europe uh, in the years to come. And sometimes I think it's also rating is a little bit overrated because I, I, uh, there was one uh, uh, detail of the research where you say okay. Uh, at the moment, that's, uh, that's people uh, were using BlaBlaCar, they were also more likely to use other peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, solutions. But um, it's also possible that, that, that it is that uh, that's, uh, the rating and reputation and the trust is really important to people uh, to get people over the first threshold, so they have the first experience. But maybe after five times, uh, that, 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 that uh, it, it's, uh, it will be less. I, th I think that's true. I, th I think the first experience, you probably need more trust signal than you know, like when you've been using it for um, for a long time. But I, I, you, it, still, it still matters, and we see that a lot because, like for example, we, we have a bit of uh, what we call like a newbie discrimination. So the newbie discrimination is when you're a new driver on Baba Car, uh, even if you do like a Facebook profile, even if you do like a, if you have a photo, if you don't yet have all the verification, if you don't yet have any peer review because you're a newbie, so how could you have peer review? You, we see that uh, the number of passengers booking in your car is a lot less all the time, a lot less than an experienced driver, right? So, so it shows that even after a long time, all the passengers would tend to go for someone with peer reviews uh, and they still value trust quite a lot. Yeah. And, and uh, are there also ways to, to avoid this? Well, it, w what you need to do is to find like for, for, for this like newbie discrimination problem, I mean, it's not really a problem, it's just a, a fact, uh, and it's a fact of any marketplace. When, you, when you're new on the marketplace and all the other buyers and sellers have reviews and so on, you need to, to build your reputation. So the question is like, how do we help people build their reputation? And, and in a way, you, you can use all kind of external signals that are not from Blah Blah Car to actually export or import some of your trust profile from other websites. So in a way, like Facebook Connect, that's some of that. Um, uh, verifications you can do, so verifying your bank account. In some countries, you can verify your ID. It's going to increase your trust level. Um, uh, so, so we try essentially to do that, uh, or to help people actually do all whatever they can do to, to kind of um, uh, essentially to be able to enter the marketplace, uh, not as a complete newbie because they already have something. So you know, we found that if people have a Facebook Connect, they check their phone number and they have a photo, and they have a photo of their car, improves a lot already from not having a photo, for example. Cool. So, uh, uh, so you gave the talk here at the next web in Amsterdam. So, so, uh, so, uh, what, uh, what are you going to ne do next? Uh, the, uh, the next days? Well, I'm, I'm going to be here actually for the rest of the afternoon, uh, and then back, uh, back to HQ uh, tomorrow morning. So, so mostly like, I mean, you know, the, the main reason to be here, uh, it, it was to well, a, you present that trust study uh, and talk about that trust study and uh, and make it available for everyone because I think it's very helpful for any company in the sharing economy. Uh, number one. Uh, and number two, it's a great way to network with entrepreneurs, not just here from the Netherlands, uh, but from all over, right? Because it's becoming a very international uh, conference. Yeah, I think you too. Okay, great. So thanks for, for sharing, Thank you. and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.